and I'm, I'm looking forward to today. The questions are a little bit to give away, and um, yeah, we all, we all need to know how to abide in the ear of God, eh? Amen. Amen. Bless you, thank you. <clears throat> I was just going to pray real quick. Oh, Lord, well, hmm, unless the Lord builds a house, the labour is labour in vain, Lord. And uh, these guys don't need anyone to teach them. They've got the Holy Spirit to teach them, Father God. And I just pray I'll be your mouthpiece this morning. Lord, the, the word I give them will be by your Spirit, it'll be through your Spirit. And they'll have courage to receive it and understand it by your Spirit, Father God, and, the, and to apply it. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. You are worthy of all the honour, all the glory, and all the good stuff. Amen. Okay, hello. Um, so, we've been looking at this subject of intercession and interceding, and the first session we looked at what it was and what it wasn't, and we decided that in the New Testament it's about standing in the gap between uh, God and his kingdom and Satan and his kingdom, or the situation, and declaring the manifold wisdom of God into that situation or circumstance. And then in the second session, um, we looked very practically at how we do that, at how to get a, 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 you know, once you've found your promise about that situation, to start to practically declare it with your mouth whole into the situation. Um, and today we're on the third session, so I want to backpedal a little bit, actually, um, because I'm the sort of guy that I, I want to know how to do it I want to know how to do it. If I'm playing guitar and I watch someone play something, like Elias is an amazing guitarist and he was playing something the other day. I was at his house and I was like, that's lovely, but how'd you do that? <laughs> I, want to, I said, do it again and I'll record you. <laughs> and I can steal your ideas for Sunday. No. Um, so I want to know how to do it. So, so it's all very well saying, yeah, go and find a promise about that situation. Um, but how do you do that? So we'll look at that today. Um, well, then I'm going, to give, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about how things work and don't work in intercession, because I'm sure you've all had prayers that haven't been answered. I'm sure you've all experienced that. We don't build our theology on the times it didn't work, do we? We build it on what the Bible says. Um, so, um, and then I'll talk about two ways that you can practically hear the voice of the Spirit, because it's something that people get very confused about sometimes uh, early on in their, their Christian life, sometimes and even later on we get a bit confused about that. It's very practical and simple and it's nothing that everyone is able to do it. It's, it's super easy. Um, okay, so I just want to have a look at a scripture, Acts 19.13 I think. Um, Acts 19.13. I'm in Acts. Mm-hmm. And we're heading towards 15. So this is an incident that happened during the early church. It's quite interesting. I could probably preach just on this, um, but I won't. So 1913. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists took it upon themselves to call the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, we exorcise you, by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. Also there were seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest who did so. Uh, and the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? Um, then the man in whom the evil spirit was leapt out on them, overpowered them, and prevailed against them. So these are some guys that aren't Christians. They're, they've discovered that this name of Jesus is pretty powerful, so they start using it. They're like, hey, well, okay, in the name of Jesus, that works. We'll use that. But eventually they run up against um, a demon who was like, well, yeah, I know about Jesus. and I know who, who Paul is. Who are you? Like, because they didn't have something inside them that surpassed the words they were saying. It was just words to them. It's like a magic formula for them. Yeah, and some Christians approach prayer and intercession like this. Well, if I start with dear God and I end with in the name of Jesus, then that's good prayer, isn't it? That seems to work. And the thing is, it did work for the seven sons of God for, for a time. They did, it did work for them because they used it. But eventually, like, if that's your entire prayer life, yeah, you don't have something inside that really means something, you're going to run into a situation, you're going to run into a circumstance or a cancer or something's going to come and, and you'll go in the name of Jesus. And it'll be like, 
It's as if it's going, well, okay, who are you? You don't own this. You're not, this isn't a part of you. So I want to start with that because if it was as simple as, oh, right, I found the Bible verse now. You know, I've got my Gideon's Bible and I've looked to the back and it says, if you're in trouble, flick up. You know, my, I've uh, flicked it up and I've said into the air, uh, cast all your anxieties on him for he cares for you. Good, I'll feel better now. Well, if it was as easy as that, then there would never ever be an ill Christian, would there? Or anyone, there'd never ever be any, anyone depressed, no one have any problems, would it? Because we can all look up verses, can't we, and say them into the air. Yeah? And sometimes that's all you need to do. But sooner or later, sometimes you'll hit a situation and it'll say, well, I know Jesus, and I know Pastor Tony, who are you? Yeah? Because you haven't internalised that word. It's, it's just in your Gideon's Bible, it's not a part of who you are. Um, so, we're going to look at that a little bit today. The Bible says that, um, I think it's in 1 John, he was talking about um, what we've handled, what we've touched, what we've looked at, what we've seen. This we declare to you concerning the word of life. Like in another place, Paul says, what I received from God, I also passed on to you. Yeah, that on the night he was betrayed, Jesus took bread. Um, we can't really preach out of anything except what we've handled, what we've tasted, what we've known. Um, and I've said this before, but when, when it comes to intercession, when you've gone and you've found your promise, you need to get to the point where it's a part of you, that you, you believe on it, that it's in your bones almost, yeah? Um, let me... Uh, there we go. Okay. Okay, and if we look at Romans 12, verse 2, we see this again. Uh, this is a very popular verse, and rightly so. So Romans 12, verse 2. Um, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Uh, I'll read that again. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now, when we spend time with these promises that we found in the situation, they start to transform our mind. They start to change our thinking on the issue. And what this verse is saying is we become living proof of that word, that, that we, it becomes in our life. Our life proves it. It's, it's a, a living testimony to everyone around us that whatever that promise is you're living in, that, that, that God will overcome. But until you've transformed your mind, allowed the word to transform your mind, it's just words to you. It's just words on paper. It, it, it can't, like Pastor Tony was saying the other day, that this isn't the word of God. Yeah? And it's not. It's just words on paper. This is like a, a conduit. This is like a... A, a, a seed you can plant in yourself and encounter the word of God because the word of God is in heaven the word of God is Jesus and, and, and living and active okay so um, in order to, to let something get going in you you really need to just spend time with it you need to abide in it and I want to look at um, how to get a promise today but before we do that I want to look at, well, how, how, you know, how do we get that promise? How do we get there? And the primary way that you can have living words going on in your life is by abiding in, in Jesus. Okay? So we find Jesus talking about this in John 15.4. Um, I'm flicking all over the place today. Um, John 15, verse 4. 14, 15. It's going to be a super practical session today. So... Um, Okay, so John chapter 15 and verse 4, and Jesus is talking to his disciples, and he said, Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. And this glorious verse totally confused me for probably, I don't know, not quite a decade of my Christian life. And I would read it, and I'd know that it was the key to something. I'd be like, good, good. I just need to abide in you, Jesus. And I remember when I was like 13 or 14, like reading it, thinking, well, it's talking, how, how? And I was like trying, desperately trying to get it. And I remember like lying on my bedroom floor, like going, yeah, I'm a branch, Jesus. I'm abiding in the vine. I'm abiding in the vine, whatever that means. And like... Mate, I don't know, man. It confused 
really confused me. Um, how do you abide? Uh, it, sounds, it sounds very Eastern mysticism, doesn't it? You abide. Do not move. Remain. Anyway, so what does abiding mean practically? Well, practically, abiding in Jesus is about conversation. Practically, abiding in Jesus is about conversation. It's about conversation with him. Um, if you're really blessed, you'll be able to have, like, prolonged periods with God. Maybe you'll be able to spend an hour with God every day if you're super lucky. Um, but most of the time, actually, our abiding with Jesus is not those long, protracted times. It's a little ten-second bursts of conversation, of talking, listening you have with Holy Spirit during the day when you're a Christian. And um, just constantly, just like five, ten seconds, ah, oh, what do you think about this? What do you think about that, Jesus? It's allowing his word to sort of rumble around in you. Um, there's uh, a great word um, is meditate. Abiding means conversation with Jesus. Abiding means meditating on his word. And this is another word that really confused me. I was like, well, it says meditate on God's word. So what does that mean? Because my only understanding of that word comes from like Eastern mysticism. I'm like, oh, meditate on the great nothingness of, you know, within me. And it's not what it means. So we'll look at um, what meditation means real quick. Um, if you have a look at Joshua, um, chapter 1, verse 8. So that's right at the front. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and Joshua. Joshua, chapter 1, <laughs> verse 8. Here we go. And God's talking to Joshua about how it's all going to go down now, he's, now that he's taken over from Moses. And he's giving him some suggestions. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. So... God says to Joshua, don't let this book of the law depart from your eyes. He doesn't say that. He says, don't let this book of the law depart from your mouth. God was saying to Joshua, you need to be speaking out these things. And this word meditate um, in the Hebrew has a, a couple of shades of meaning. Um, partly it's to do with um, how a cow digests grass. That, um, I learned at school that a cow has more than one stomach. Is that right? It has three stomachs. Okay, one stomach with three chambers. There you go. Someone more educated than myself. But, um, but basically, like when a cow chews grass, it has to like, to like swallow it and then it comes up again, then it chews it again. And, and like, um, this is what God says uh, partly in this word meditate. He says, well, look, get the word and just turn it over, turn it over, turn it over in your mind. Try and swallow it. It doesn't quite go in. Bring it up again. Turn it over, turn it over, turn it over. Eventually, you'll internalize it. And it will become a part of you. And um, that's partly what it means by meditate. The other meaning of the word meditate is to mutter or to speak out loud. Yeah? There's something very dynamic that happens when you open your mouth and speak. Yeah. Um, there's a whole brand of, um, of science called neurolinguistic programming, which is all about um, how your brain and your thoughts are all allied to what comes out of your mouth and how your body is speech activated to a degree. And um, God understands that. And he understands that as you speak out his word, something dynamic happens. Um, there's a voice in the world that only you can hear. And it's your voice. Because have you ever heard yourself on an answer phone message or on a recording? You've, have you ever heard it and it's not, it doesn't sound like you, does it? You're like, ooh... Uh, that's, I don't like that. I'm recording this at the moment, and I'm sure I'll listen back to it and go, ooh, and my vowel's really that coarse. I don't like that. Um, but the reason it doesn't sound like you is because when you speak, you're not listening to you. You're hearing the, the reverberation of your own skull. You're hearing all sorts of other things that other people can't hear. And when you talk to yourself about something, um, that's a very powerful voice for your 
your soul to get hold of. Like if you, if you say like, I'm never driving in London again, or something like that, which I was tempted to say yesterday. Like, we were driving home from London. <laughs> it, was, it was bad, and I, I, I get a little stressed with driving. And I was really tempted to turn around to my wife and say, we're never doing this again. But I didn't, because I knew that that would be a curse that I put over myself, that my soul would hear me saying that, and it would have an impact on me, and the next time I needed to drive somewhere, it would be like difficult. It would be even more difficult, because I'd spoken this out, I'd meditated on that. But if you think about it, we meditate, we tell ourselves things all the time. Like, generally bad things. Like, you'll hear people say, Oh yes, yeah, flu season again. I just know I'm going to get it. I just know. Yeah, I hate that. I hate that. Yeah, I really hate that. I'm, I deliberately go against that. Yeah. You'll find me saying things like, So, oh, yeah, oh, here's, we'll hear me listening to something on Radio 2, you know, the guy I'm working with or whatever, and it'll say, Oh yeah, such and such baby like protracted this disease and people start talking about it. And I just say something like, it's never going to happen in my house. What? It's never going to happen in my house. Right. Like, they say, oh, well, you just don't know. I said, no, it's never going to happen in my house. I don't care. Like, where, I mean, I care, but I say, if any child is not going to suffer that, my child's not going to suffer that. When I hear, like, all these stories about, like, you know, Okay, we've not got kids here. So, about, about people fiddling with children and, and, and all this stuff, and you get a bit scared, oh, can my kid go and play? Like, what's going on? I always say something like, it's never going to happen to my children. Like, as soon as that thought of fear comes in my head, I always say something opposite the fear, because I know that the voice I have has, has power. Like, if someone says something about an addiction or something like that, um, you know, well, you've got to watch, you know, how much wine you drink, because you... Blah, blah, blah. I'll say... It's never going to happen to me. I'm never going to get to the stage where I'm like really super struggling with that. And because it's good for my heart to, to say positive things. Yeah. So, recapitulation. So abiding in Jesus, this thing that really confused me, really it's about conversation. It's about conversation with him through the day. Just little 10 second bursts of conversation about every single thing. Um, it's about meditation on the word, which just means speaking it out loud and, you know, just letting it ruminate. And once you've meditated and chewed the cut of that word, it becomes a part of you. And then when you hit your situation, your situation's not going to turn around to you and go, well, I know Jesus, but who are you? Uh, I know Pastor Tony, who are you? What, What are you coming? You don't really believe these things, do you? Once you've spent time meditating in the word, you'll find that hope is able to really gain hold on that and hang on to it. And where hope hangs on to it, faith will come along and energise that hope and bring it into manifestation, bring it into reality. Um, But unless you don't have any... Unless you... We've said this before. If you don't have anything for your hope to latch on to, you're not going to get an awful lot going on. And you'll just get into this lie about, well, it probably wasn't God's will at the time. Maybe that was, you know, uh, you start telling yourself these ghost stories to try and let God off the hook a little bit. Okay, so let's come into, um, so we all understand what abiding means, don't we? Abiding means Conversation. conversation, thank you. Okay, so when Jesus says abide in me and I'll abide in you, it means, he's kind of saying, talk to me. Talk to me and I'll talk to you. Talk to me about everything, okay? You can talk to Holy Spirit about anything. He loves to talk about anything. You can say to him, Holy Spirit, what do you think about my guitar playing this morning? Holy Spirit, how do you feel about this issue that that I'm thinking about? Holy Spirit, what do you think about how I'm decorating my house? What do you think about how I'm my exercise routine? How do you feel about, like, how I'm loving my wife? What do you think about like anything? Just ask him on any subject and he'll give you some wisdom on that subject. He'll give you something good. Um, okay, so let's come into the second bit. Um, yeah, and um, talk about super, super practically. Um, so now we've got our situation. We want to intercede. We've said, like, let's take the situation of, of Milena. This lady that Andrea and I know, who's heard that she's got some sort of, um, is it malignant, this cancer, this stomach cancer? Okay, and she's going to have to go and get an operation, and she's contacted us, and she said, well, will you pray? So, 
one of the first things we did was um, was pray. We just we just said okay, and and we didn't pray as soon as I heard about it because I was in a car in London traffic and I was super stressed, and it was not a good time for me to go. Yeah, let's stand in faith right now. So I waited till I had a time to do it, and then I said, well, there's no time like the present. Let's just do it. So we just hit it um, this morning. But one of the things I did do was I said, look, Holy Spirit burden us with this Be, burden us with this until it's, it's done, we give you permission to burden us with this and, and as, as we're learning to be intercessors we want to give God opportunity to mess with us yeah. over an issue to, to, to bother us on an issue and so that we can't like get away from it ok so I'm going to talk about two basic ways now that you can abide with God that you can hear the voice of God in a very practical way and this is going to be really good as well if you've you know, you're hearing all these things about, oh, Holy Spirit said this, and Holy Spirit said that, and, and you think, wow, oh, man, he talks to you a lot, doesn't he, mate? Um, often, I'll, often I'll say things like that, but that's just a language that I use to talk about, you know, God's been talking to me. He might have been talking to me through the Bible. He might have been talking to me through whatever. But if you're um, thinking, well, how, how do I? How do I go and do that? How do I go and get a promise? How do I find one? Well, first of all, spending time in the Word Holy Spirit will give you um, promises. I'm um, in the middle of, well, not in the middle of, towards the end of a really difficult situation at the moment, as some of you know about. Um, and about six months ago, when I was going into this situation, um, I decided I was going to set aside specific periods of time to do this, just abide in Jesus and wait on God and ask God to give me a word about the situation. Like, I don't know if I can find this. Since that time, I've got... Let's have a look. One, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine pages worth of different promises that God's given me from the Bible about that. Um, so he gave me a lot more than one. That was good. And as you spend time just in the Word, you'll find that things will jump out at you. So how do we do it? How do we practically do it? Well, I'm going to talk about two ways. The first way is uh, something that the people often call journaling, and um, the second way is, is something called pray, re- pray reading the Word. And they're both super simple. Super simple way you can start hearing from the Holy Spirit if, you're, if that's something new to you. I still do these all the time. In fact, I, I do pray reading the Word most days. I think that's one of the biggest things that will help you to abide. So journaling. You will need a Bible... You will need something to write on. You will need probably a pen, okay? Unless you can beam your thoughts directly onto the paper. So, um, you want to hear the Word of God? Well, just open the Bible, look at a verse, read it. That's the Word of God, okay? But that doesn't mean a lot to me. So, journaling, what you do is you start reading your Bible and then you ask God to help you personalise it to you. Okay, so I'm going to look up Psalm 1. That's a nice place to start. So I'll look up Psalm 1, and it says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. So I'll read that, and I'll say, God, I want to hear your voice today, I want to talk to you. Help me to hear your voice. And then I'll just start to write. And I'll write this back to myself as if it's God speaking it to me. So I'll usually start with my dear child or my beloved son, because that's generally how God sees me. So so my beloved son, you're blessed when you don't walk in the counsel of the ungodly. And then I'd like Holy Spirit will start unpacking it for me a little bit and I say something like, so stop listening to things that non-Christians are saying about your issues. And then I'll carry on. You're blessed when you don't stand in the path of sinners, when you, when you don't put yourself in a situation, my son, where you're you know, in the thoroughfare of what sinners are doing. You're blessed when you don't sit in the seat of the scornful. And then I find that Holy Spirit will often start doing business with me over an issue, and it becomes about me. And... Often, like, God will, on this particular one, I remember, like, God talking to me about my attitude when I drive, yeah? And I was like, well, I don't sit in the seat of the scornful. And Holy Spirit was like, you do when you drive. 
Yeah. It's like you do when you drive, when you're looking at other people drive, and you're like, come on, get out of that junction, woman, or whatever it is, man. Like, so God starts doing business with me as I started journaling, and I end up with a written thing of what he said. And, um, and you can make it as long or as short, and you can go back to it and read it again then, yeah. when, you, when you think, oh man, it's been ages since God talked to me. What was the last thing God said to me? If you're not sure, you can go back and read. I've got stuff that I've journaled going back quite a long time. And it's a really great way to start hearing the Holy Spirit. And you know you're on track because it's the Bible. It's the Bible, right? Um, and people struggle with journaling because they're like, but that seems very simple. That seems pretty basic. Um, but it, that's okay. That's all right. You're like, you'll, you'll be surprised with how much God will unpack to you through the Holy Spirit yeah. doing that. So that's journaling. So go and have a go at it if you've not done it. Okay? So you you all understand journaling. Everyone's looking at me sort of blankly. What? What? Okay. So you, and you can start anywhere. If you're not sure where, where to start with God on an issue, if you're praying into an issue like with Milena and this operation situation, like sometimes I'm not sure where to start in the Bible looking for a, a word about that. So I'll generally go back to somewhere that I know on that issue and just start seeking God again from that point. And he'll very quickly usually start reminding you of something. Um, smartphones are great or computer or tablet they're great um, because what I find is Holy Spirit will often just remind me about a verse and I don't know where to find it like he'll say you know you will not die but live and I'm like I know that's in the Bible I know that's in the Bible I don't know where it is so I just pull up Google and I put in you will not die but live and that will give me where it is and then I'll go to that and I'll start journaling from it and I'll start praying from it I'll start meditating on it I'll start abiding in it um, on Milena's behalf, okay, that's what intercession is sometimes, you're doing it on behalf of someone else who's perhaps too exhausted or, or too scared or too busy or whatever, you know, they need you to stand in the gap for them, um, so I'll start doing it and then as we do it, you know, if God gives us a specific word, we'll probably share it with her um, and, and people trip up on this stuff because it's very simple, it's very simple to do, anyone can do it, um, okay, so that's journaling. That's a very simple way that you can uh, start to hear God, start to unpack things from the Holy Spirit about an issue. And uh, I don't always do it. I do it kind of occasionally these days. Um, but like I say, I mean, this is my sort of journal thing. And I've got all sorts of stuff in here. But I have got, like, things that God's told me that I've written down that go back quite a fair bit. And I'll go back to it often. And I'll be like, wow. And the other thing that I do um, is... If God tells us something in a specific instance, then I'll write it down. And sometimes Andrea and I will have something and we'll write it down and we'll sign it to remember it. Because otherwise you forget about it. And it's good to go back and remember things. I've got stuff in here. Um, I remember when Andrea was pregnant with um, our first child, Ethan. Uh, that's his name. And um, I remember, like, uh, you were really scared because the only reason I remember it is because I read it the other day and I've completely forgotten about it um, but you were really scared because you had all this terrible pain you were waking up at four in the morning like every night and we went to the doctor and the doctor was like ooh not sure you need to anyway and we prayed about it we decided we weren't going to go um, to, to hospital and get it checked out we were going to pray about it and then that night like you've got this thing written down in here where you say oh last night I woke up and I could hear I could hear my child's heartbeat. And I knew it would be all right. And like we wrote that down because otherwise I'd have forgotten about it. I'd have completely forgotten about it. And, um, but I've got this written down as a testimony. And I go back to these things when my faith is weak. When I'm seeking God on an issue for someone else. I often go back to these things. And I'm like, yeah, I remember that. I remember when God did that. And he's the same. Okay, so pray reading the word is kind of pretty much like journaling, only you don't need a pen and paper. Um, and what it is, is it's a way of meditating on the word. So you're praying God's word back to him. And just in the course of my uh, Bible study, whenever something jumps out at me, I'll kind of pray read it through. So let's say, um, I'm going to change to Psalm 37 now, because that's another favourite of mine. Um, you can get a lot of juice out of Psalm 37. Um, here we are. So let's say I'm going through this psalm, 
and I've decided I'm, I'm, I'm going to meditate on it, I'm going to spend some time with God. So I'll just start reading it, and I'll often read it out loud, okay, because that's what the word meditate means, is to mutter. So as long as I'm not, you know, in a public place where people are going to think I'm a complete nut, then I'll, I'll often read it out loud, because um, it helps me internalise it. So I'll say, don't fret because of evildoers, nor be envious of the workers of iniquity, for they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. And then I'll stop there and I'll just pray it back to God. I'll pray it back to God. So I'll say, oh God, help me. Help me not to fret. Help me not to fret. And because there's a lot of evil people in the world and it freaks me out. It freaks me out that my, I've got children now and they're going to grow up in this world and I'm responsible for them and there's evil people around. I don't know who's safe and who's not. Um, but you say in your word, don't fret. So help me not to fret. And then I'll carry on and I'll say, okay, help me not to be envious of people that are doing wrong because I am envious of people that do wrong sometimes. I'm envious of people that have got like more money than me and they've got it through a kind of slightly underhand way. And I'm sometimes envious of people that are like out there, you know, whatever. Um, help me with that. Help me. I understand that they'll soon be cut down like the grass. Like in your mind, it's all good. And I'll just continue on like that. And often, like Holy Spirit will just highlight something for me. Like on this, on verse 6, I've highlighted, He shall bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. Like, I've been in a situation before where I was being, being accused of something and that really jumped out at me. That was from God and I'll often write it down. So that's pray reading the word. It's super easy. It's super easy. And that's why people really struggle with it. They're like, is that it? You just... You read the word and then you pray it back to God. That, that's it, is it? That's this meditation thing. Yeah, that's it. That's what you do. That's how you abide in Jesus. That's how you meditate on the word. And it will get inside you and it won't let you go. And then you'll, what you'll find is the more you've been doing it, Nothing will happen. But then one day you'll be at a prayer meeting or you'll be praying for a brother or something will happen. You'll just be praying with your wife in the kitchen and words will fall out of you yes. that you didn't know were there. Yes. I've been in a prayer meeting before and Matt's come up to me afterwards and he's been like, wow, the word's kind of falling out of you today. And, and it's because I've just been spending a little bit of time. Like, and you know what? During that time, I feel often nothing. I often, that time's hard, yeah, and I'm just saying that because I think we trip up because we think we should be having this awesome time with God. I'm like, oh, I've got half an hour, I'm going to spend it with you, God, I miss you, God, I'm going to spend it with you. Mm, okay, that was all right, you know, I pray, pray, read the word, maybe I journaled a bit, didn't feel any great big, you know, because grass is pretty boring when the cow eats it, isn't it? it, it it's, you know, you're not getting a lot of milk out of that. It's, it's like... Rum, 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 rum. But later on, when it's had time to go around a little bit, when I've been pray reading it, I go into a prayer meeting, or someone says, oh, I'm going through this, and something is in me to give. I've got something inside me to give now, and I'm like, do you know... Uh, no, do you remember we were talking about this a few weeks ago? Holy Spirit will remind you. He'll bring to your remembrance the word. And suddenly it's there. It's there in my mind. And I know it. I'm like, the word says. And out it comes. And it's not just that it's come out. It's that I own it. Okay? Because, so intercession. We've gone. We've got the promise. The promise is in us. Now we're ready to declare the promise into the situation, to declare the manifold wisdom of God to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places, to the demonic powers over that situation, or whatever it is. Maybe there aren't demonic powers over the situation. Maybe it's just a straightforward situation. We can still declare it. So the intercessor comes, he owns that word, or she owns that word. It's a part of her. So she goes to the situation, and if it's a, a demonic situation, then the demon will know. They're like, oh, hang on. We've got to be careful about, about Gary, because Gary's not just going to come and flick up some verse. He, he knows it. He's lived it. He's living proof of it. Look at his family. Look at his children. Look at everything God's doing in his life. This guy is the living, breathing word of God. Yeah? He's, he's, the, he's the, the very natural, normal 
communal garden thing that's hosting the divine thing. Yeah. Okay? And the situation will, will move for Gary because in a way that it wouldn't for someone that's just read a verse that morning and decided to throw it at the situation. Now, sometimes that's all you do need to do. Okay? But... So the intercessor goes, he gets the promise, he declares it to the situation, and he asks God to burden him about it so that he doesn't stop, he won't stop until he, that situation bows to the word of God and unlocks. Okay? Um, I'm just going to leave you with something very beautiful from Exodus, I think it's 17. Um, again, I could probably talk on this for ages, but I'm not going to. So Exodus is the second book of the Bible, and uh, chapter 17, and verse 8. Victory over the Amalekites. Wow, yeah, I could talk about Amalek. Wow. Okay, so Amalek, the Amalekites are a group of people, and they came out of um, the, the child that came by works, the uh, child of the child of the flesh works rather than the child of the promise. The child that didn't inherit anything because it was just the child of the slave woman. And then, um, and the Amalekites kind of represent um, people that when you're flying in freedom in Christ, come along and go, you shouldn't really be doing that. You should do it like this. Um, anyway, but we, we don't have time to go there today. Now, Amalek came and fought with Israel in Rephidim. And Moses said to Joshua, Choose us some men and go out, fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses said to him and fought with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And so it was when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands became heavy. So they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. And Aaron and her supported his hands, one on one side and the other on the other side. And his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. So Joshua defeated Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. So you've got these two leaders. You've got the leader that's going out to physically do stuff, battle stuff. Okay, because unless Joshua goes and physically kills these guys, doesn't matter how much you pray, nothing's probably going to happen. So you need a Joshua, okay? And you've got Moses, who says, "I'll go up on this hill." Now, fortunately, Joshua knew God, and he didn't do what I'd probably do in that situation and go, "Oh, thanks. <laughs> Off you go then. I'll just, yeah, you'll t- take Aaron and her." You know, for, for, for Joshua understood that his victory was reliant on more than just force of arms. So you've got Joshua and his guys, they're going to attack. And Moses on a hill with the rod of God. Well, what's the rod of God? What is it? Well, it was the shepherd's rod, not the staff, the rod. It's like a stick with a ball on the end that you hit things with. It's very boring. Uh, it's very normal. It's dusty and worn and old and there's nothing exciting about it it's smelly okay the rod of god but this is the rod that god said what have you got in your hand moses what have you got in your hands i've got this rod throw it down on the floor and it became a snake and you can read about that and every miracle pretty much that moses did it said i'll stretch your rod out over the water so the rod of god represents something common or garden that has been imbued with the divine. Something just so normal and so boring and so pedestrian that suddenly becomes something miraculous and something powerful and something situation-changing, game-changing. And this is what God says, we'll take the rod of God and raise it up. So he's praying, he's raising up this symbol of the divine inhabiting the normal. Now that's an allegory, that's a picture of you, that's a picture of the church. Something so normal hosting something so divine. And I just wanted to leave you with this, because in a situation like, like with Milena, or whatever situation you're facing, you've got to do and do and fight and war and physically get in there and change things and man up or whatever it is and get it done as if that's 
The only thing that's going to change the situation, you've got to go and fight against Amalek. But at the same time, you've got to pray and pray and pray and pray and hold on and meditate on the word and abide in God and declare into that situation as if that's the only thing that's going to change the situation. Because they both are working together. You need Moses and you need Joshua. Okay? You need to be raising up your understanding that I'm just normal and I can't face this situation. But you are inhabiting me, changing me. Yeah, hallelujah so don't be afraid to pray read the word don't be afraid to have a go at journaling try it what's the worst that can happen if you get into real error then you know well, well one of the leaders will come and help you out but like Tony said the other day do you think that you're going to go to the Holy Spirit and say will you talk to me and he's going to give you something bad he's going to allow you know the devil to come in and, and, and warp your understanding of him no he won't do that he's a good God thank hallelujah. you bless you hallelujah When God speaks to me at a particular point in my life, I underline it or I put a mark there. Yeah. I can read.